Shut up and sit down. Welcome to True Crime Groove. I'm your host, Mays. With me, as always, is my good friend, Tex. How are you doing today, Tex? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Can't complain. We wanted to uh, thank everyone for listening to the podcast today. This is going to be a part two of a story we started. If you have not heard part one, it will be linked in the description. But thank you all for supporting us. We really appreciate everyone who supports the channel. And just much thanks and love to all of you for that. We started talking about the lovely town of uh, Jennings, Louisiana, and the eight murders that occurred there, and then the subsequent ridiculous police investigation that followed these murders. Like I said, this is going to be part two. This is True Crime Groove. Let's get our groove on and talk some true crime. This is the story of the Jefferson Davis Eight. We're going to start talking about one of the officers, Terry Gillery. He was the warden at the jail during the murders. His ex-wife, Paula, was an investigator at the sheriff's office as well. Terry knew most of the victims, if not all, and was related to Nicole Gillery. She was the eighth victim. They were. I was going to say, she's one of the victims, right? Right, the, uh, the eighth, the last victim. They were cousins. Nicole had told her mom that Terry would have slept with her had they not been related. And Terry said that it didn't matter. They weren't that close of cousins. What kind of water are you guys drinking down there, Tex? (laughs) You know, if your first cousins, I guess that's one thing. But if you're, you know, I don't know, maybe second or third is a different thing. I don't know. Uh, Okay. So, uh, yeah. Inmates came forward and said that Terry could make their life miserable if they didn't do what he said. On the outside, he would trade for information. He would let a ticket go for information. Um, you know, that's not, that's not something that I guess is unheard of. But he would also let a drug charge go. He I also guess, had... I guess it depends on what kind of information you're getting. <laughs> Must be a whopper. Yeah. Yeah. He also had a thing for Loretta Chason Lewis. She was the first victim. They had some kind of relationship. Loretta's brother, he can remember being picked up. Terry picked him up. And they were taken to Terry's house. Loretta was 14 or 15. And he can remember Loretta coming out of Terry's bedroom, and he had had sex with her. An inmate also said that Terry had sex with Loretta when she was in jail. She watched them through a hole in the wall. Terry's never been charged with anything, any of this, which is, I don't have words for that. So, This is basically, from what I'm getting the picture of here is, I murder someone. And then they put me in charge of investigating it. That about right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Now, Loretta would go to someone's house. Her name was Barbara Ann. When she was, you know, wanting to just chill out for a few days. Like, burnt out. And she would go there and stay for a few days. Terry went to Barbara Ann's house and told Barbara Ann, Hey, I'm just checking on Loretta. (laughs) <laughs> you know, Barbara Ann's like, what? You know, you, you just popped up all of a sudden to check on Loretta? What What the hell? Oddly enough, though, this was the same day her body was found. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So the jailer came to her house? That came, to, friend, came to her friend's house. Her friend's house and so, inquired about her. So not only did he know where she went to chill out, he just came to check on her. Yeah, he just just popping in to see how she's doing. Oh, and we, and we found her body. But he didn't. He didn't say that. He didn't tell him about the body. But they did find the body. Uh, 
the I'm, same. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't. Yeah, you would. wouldn't be surprised. Also, the sixth victim, Crystal Benoiseno. Crystal babysat for Terry. He also partied with Frankie Richard at his brother Billy's. Sounds Tra- like they all kind of partied with Frankie. All these cops are it's- partying at this drug dealer's house. Yes, they did. <laughs> they all, Frankie, Frankie knew a lot. On the day that Crystal was murdered, she had called Terry. What was actually said between the two of them, of course, is not known. But soon after they talked, she got into a white truck with a group of men. These men are known as Frankie Richard's hands-on men. In other words, they do his dirty work. So for Frankie Richard to say he never touched or murdered or killed any of these girls is most likely a true statement. He has people for that. Two weeks later is when her body was found. And as we talked about before, that Terry showed up at the Benoit family home, which is Crystal's cousin. And he told her that Crystal was dead, but I didn't kill her. So I guess he assumed that they would think he did. He said that... He said they, Crystal is dead, but I didn't but kill but her. I didn't kill her. Assuming that they would think he did it? Well, no one accused him of it. He just yeah, said well, it. That, that's just... Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. It's that very he, weird. They're all like family or something. It's... I mean, he's not related to Crystal, but... Well, they're sleeping, he said that, uh, they're sleeping with their own cousins. So. This is, Crystal is, Crystal was the victim that they found her, was, she was in the woods, and there were skeletal remains. Now, and if you remember, Terry said that he saw a tattoo on her back, and that's how he knew it was her. Right. Uh, yeah, but from the report, there was nothing to see. Hunters did not even know it was a body until they saw the skull. What happened is he saw uh, tattoos on, somehow... A tattoo artist had gotten inside her body and tattooed her bones, is is how I believe it took place. Exactly. Now, there was one witness, Russell Carrier. His sister is uh, Barbara Ann, who was this motherly figure to a lot of these girls. That's the one we talked about a little while ago. Uh, Russell was around the area at the time Crystal was murdered, on the, out on the road smoking crack. He would go into these wooded areas. He was riding the back roads, came upon three guys exiting the area where Crystal's body was found. They were Frankie's hands-on men. Now, Frankie denies having hands-on men. I mean, Russell knows Frankie. He also knew these men, and he reported it. On October the 10th of 2010, Russell was found dead, struck by a train in Jennings. They said he laid on the tracks, and it was suicide, and the family said no way that that happened. Here they have another witness that comes forward to say that Frankie's hands-on men had something to do with killing Crystal, and he winds up dead. So, and many people claim that Terry Gillery and his ex-wife, investigator Paula, have partied with Frankie Richard at this party house on McKinley Road. It, like I said before, it sounds like they all have. They definitely have. People wondered that knew these girls that Roxanne was another one that the girls would come to, to her house as well, come, to, you know, when they got burnt out. You know, she was asked questions why was it these eight girls? Why wasn't it just some girl walking down the street? Why specifically these eight? Because they knew stuff. That's, you know, and, and these girls knew they were going to be victims. Right. And that's the thing. It's not so much. I'm not sure if it's so much what they knew, well, or maybe what they saw, but there was somebody in this group of people that when they told you to do something, if you didn't do it, you got hurt bad. And they knew that. So it could have been something they saw or heard or or whatever, but it also could have just been an act of a defiance that they were defying someone in this group or, you know, different people in this group. And the way they dealt with that, the punishment was of the utmost, you know, of the highest order. Right. Well, it was definitely about sex and drugs, for sure. Once you start looking at the story, it wasn't just about drugs in Jennings and the drugs that these people were doing. It turns into drugs trafficked 
between Houston and New Orleans through I-10. Jennings is right in the middle, and it's an enormous drug trade. One man yeah. they confiscated, they said, had between, I don't know, was it 3 to $18 million worth of cocaine in yeah, one drug stop on I-10. And they say not all of the drugs made it to the, you know, where they keep stuff like that, locked up. Well, and we've I've we've had some of this kind of stuff it happen in Ohio, and the, the same thing uh, applies. There's a, it's not an interstate; it's a it's a route, uh, Route 23, but it goes all the way from Toledo all the way through. It goes right through Chillicothe, right, and then right through Portsmouth into West Virginia and Kentucky. So, and and that a lot of the stuff you're talking that we've been talking about. Similar things like this have occurred, but not quite in the uh, amount that that happened in Jenny. Uh, one another police chief, Johnny Lassiter, he had pled guilty to counts of pilfering from theft of drugs and money from police department's evidence room. November fifteenth, twenty thirteen, more than four thousand dollars and eighteen hundred pills, marijuana, and codeine were missing. Well, this is. This is sort of a, a thing in Louisiana. I was not aware of this, but, and I don't know if you're ready for this. You're not? <laughs> I am. <laughs> you are? Okay. Yeah. This, this law or whatever that they passed where they can basically pull you over, search your car, take property, but not arrest you. They'll just grab your golf clubs out of the back of your, tr- out of your trunk and walk off with them. Right. Dateline did a, had a hidden camera. Yeah, it's, and it's legal. And uh, the, the, these Dateline cars were set up to not speed. They won't go more than 65 miles an hour. Yeah, there and was no reason for them to be pulling them over. No reason for them to pull them over whatsoever. And then the sheriff said, well, you know, if they were speeding, then, you know, we pulled them over. And they were saying, well, they weren't speeding. So they take cash. They take, you know, whatever. So if you, if you weren't working on the force, if you weren't working for them, you were working with them. That's all there was to it. Right. Even even Frankie Richard made statements saying that he did not trust the police. However, walked away from all allegations against him, which was over 20 arrests. And he cooperated numerous times with task force. They were very buddy buddy. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Because they didn't, they didn't go after him, but he never ratted on them either. He said he didn't trust them. Correct. But, but he never said, well, I know Terry. I know what Terry did, and I'm going to tell somebody one of these days. <clears throat> or, well, maybe <laughs> he did. But, but, I mean, you know, you get what I'm saying. Like they, they, it's like they never went after each other, even though it, it seemed like they had the goods on each other. So maybe that's why. I, I don't know. I think it goes way up, but I don't know. I mean. Yeah, two, it, could, it could go pretty high up. Yeah, they had in 2009, there was an alleged theft ring where they had a lot of weapons stolen and moved to a place called Chad's Pawn Shop. They had strong evidence against Frankie Richard. Then the evidence disappeared. <laughs> no. And they found that Paula Gilry mishandled the evidence. And if you remember, she's the ex-wife of Terry Gilry. She was fired. Oh, well, her, her side of the story is that, yes, the evidence was gone. But if you remember, Warren Gary was in charge of the evidence room. Right. And at the time this happened, there were seven bodies. <laughs> the case against Frankie fell apart. No, no evidence. Now there, uh, we talked about Danny Sims before. He was the detective. Uh, he was the one that was involved with Crystal Zenos. Okay. Uh, her cousin, Sarah Benoit, she was an informant for Danny. He caught her with one ounce of marijuana. Uh, after that, if she did not do what he asked, he said he would call child welfare and have her kids picked up. And if, if you don't remember Danny, Danny was the one that had the trailer that everybody knew was like a sex dungeon. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
he wanted her to bust a few people in town, and she did. There were six people. Then she found out how much trouble she was going to get into, so she got out of it because she was so scared. I mean, you know, she was going to wind up dead. Well, it. I think the word had started to get around that she was a rat. Yeah. So, and I don't know what the because all of the girls that died were informants too. So, did they die because they were informants? Which it's would mean possible. someone other than the police had something to do with their deaths. Well, that's the thing. It's possible that they so, were killed because they were informants, but the cops' investigation would be what I would call less than a joke. I mean, or more than, right. a, jo- more than a joke. So, whoever yeah, killed them, the cops weren't really trying to find the person who did it. Yeah. Why weren't they finding out who, who killed these girls then? Right. Because not finding out just makes them look like they know and they're not going to say. I mean, it, your informants are getting killed and they're supposed right. to be inf- informing for you so you can do your job better and all that, but you're not going to look for the person that's killing that, them? I, I don't know. It doesn't really... That make sense. Yeah, it doesn't really jive. A lot of it doesn't make sense. That's true. This case is... is the When you read and watch the stuff on this case, you go, what? What? Yeah. And we get to Stephen Gunter. He and Terry Gillery were good, very good friends. However, Steve got set up. June the 9th of 07, Stephen and... Loretta Lacoste, that was his girlfriend, they were arguing. Now, this is in Lake Arthur. Police came, and that's to the west of Jennings, not far. And they said, it's fine, we're fine, we don't need you, y'all can leave. Both of them told him that. They said, well, does he have a gun? And she said, he has a shotgun, but it's hidden, he doesn't know where it is. So, instead of them leaving, more police come. And then... For some reason, Terry comes. Somebody calls Terry, and he comes. So they're not arguing anymore. They've asked him to leave, but still more cops come. Terry comes in the back of the house, and a shot gets fired, and then you hear a lot of shots. Terry said that they both fired at each other at exactly the same time, and Stephen died. Now, the interesting thing on this is that you have two corners. The coroner called Stephen's sister, or, or said, didn't, hadn't called her yet, he said that he was tired of covering up this shit. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> now, Stephen had multiple gunshot wounds to both of his wrists, which tells you that his wrists were uh, probably above his head. The late well, Charles, it, the late Charles coroner, called his sister. Said there was no gun residue on his hands. Were they claiming suicide? No, no. Okay. Terry said he he pulled the gun. He had a gun and pulled it on him, and they shot each. They shot the gun at the same time, and Terry shot him. But he had gun. He he holes did. in his wrists. Right. So he was holding his hands up. Yeah. Either above his head or just like right out, out in front of him, like, don't shoot me, kind of a... Exactly. Yeah. So okay. the, the late, char- the, late, the one coroner had called and said there was no gunshot residue on his hands. Would there be? If he had a gun and he fired it, oh, yeah. Okay, if he had a gun in his hand and, he, yeah, okay, gotcha, fired gotcha. It. gotcha. Yeah. So the then coroner, the other coroner, called and said, what did the Lake Charles coroner say? She told him, and he got very upset and said, well, we didn't test him for gun residue. We didn't test him because there was gun residue all over his body because he was shot so many times. Well, that was my thinking is... That is, no, there there can't be. There's going to be bullets. You can't get gun residue unless you're shooting. Well... No, if you're close to somebody and you shoot them, the residue comes out of the barrel. You'd have to be standing close. right in front of them. 
Yeah, so they had police on the outside of the house and Terry on the inside. So no, there was there was gun residue, no gun residue on this on his hands. He would have had to have it on his hands. But lo and behold, guess what got lost? Uh, I don't know. Steve's At this point, gun. anything. Steve's gun out of the evidence locker. Oh, it got they 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 mis they misplaced it. Huh? <laughs> Steve I Gunter mean, knew also I mean, all of these girls, and he knew a lot about Terry Gillery. He lived across the street from him. Steve Gunter's family, they brought a civil suit against law enforcement in Lake Arthur and Jefferson Davis Parish. I want to talk again about Chris Richard. He was in rehab, and Frankie Richard showed up in rehab as well. Now, a lot of the time, the sheriff's department said, well, you know, they didn't have enough info, witnesses, people were not coming forward. People, you know, people would clam up and not say anything. Well, just to show that they they did have people to come forward. Frankie at the rehab, he was in charge of laundry. He had a little coffee station set up. This guy, you know, I don't know what it is with this guy, but anyway. He's a, so, he's a, char- he's a character. <laughs> you know, he had like a little desk and coffee and, you know, whatever. He probably had breakfast brought to him. I don't know. But Chris would sit. And talk to him. While I did, Frankie confess. Uh, he's a relative? Him. He's a relative? No, no. There's a lot of reshards. Okay, so just two, just happens to be another reshard. Right. I mean, it didn't say that they were related. It's just, you know, another or reshard. As, or as I was calling him, R- Richard. Richard, yeah. He's French. <laughs> Cajun French. Frankie confessed to killing Whitney Dubois. He, t- he told Chris that he had beaten and killed her in a camper trailer where his brother Billy stayed on the side of his mama's house. And they put her in, or he put her in a 55-gallon drum behind his mama's house. He also confessed to killing Kristen, but wouldn't go into details. Now, when, when, they found, when they found the, the first girl that you mentioned, was she, was she beaten? Whitney was the one they said her body was decomposed, and she had okay. some... Knife wounds. Hmm, okay, so he, but so he that's, he, that contradicts what he. It does contradict said. some okay. of it, but they also say the knife wound part came from somewhere else. So all they said was, "Well, she, her body was decomposed." And then when you look into further, they it says no. The police report said no. She had, I think, she was one that had the three incised cuts on her neck. Her throat was slit. So okay. He also confessed to killing Kristen. He didn't go into details about that. Well, the next morning, Chris Richard told administra- uh, the administrators that Frankie confessed to that. So the next thing that happens is, is they He's come, arrested. Uh, Frankie He's gets imme- picked up. He's immediately arrested. And they took him home. Oh, the, oh, they just took him back to his house? Yeah, they took Frankie home. Oh, okay. So he's out of rehab. <laughs> so people did put themselves at risk. And the information just goes nowhere. Frankie denied the murders. And it's hearsay. Right. Which, which is what you find a lot of the time when these people, it's like they, the ones that did go are witnesses that we've already talked about. They said this and that. Oh, well, that's hearsay. Well, well and that's the thing. You can't just arrest somebody just simply because they said this guy did it. You have, yeah. to, have, you have to have more than that. But the problem is it doesn't look like they ever took, bothered to take the time to see if there was anything to it. Right. That you there, just, if there so the guy, confessed, the guy says he killed two people and you come pick him up and take him home? That's, that's just standard police uh, procedure. That's just, it doesn't make any no, sense. No, nor, normally you would take the guy to a, the police station. You, you put him in this little room. That has a, a it has a table and a chair, and you start asking them questions. Right. But that's not how they do it in Jennings. In Jennings, if you're accused of a murder and you're in rehab, they just pick you up from the rehab and take you back to your house. I, I need that kind of luck. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, there were two state troopers. They were retired state troopers. One was Bucky Mie and the other was Tanny DeVilliers. They've both been on 
on the force for 20 years. Such colorful names in Louisiana. They are. Yeah. Hard to say if you don't, you know, been around there. Yeah, no, no way I would have been able to pronounce some of these names. They started being concerned because nothing was getting done. No, nobody knew anything. There were no arrests. No, you know, anybody they arrested, they let go. Well, Frankie was pretty much the, the, two, the two men. And then Frankie, that was pretty much it. They all got off. They started talking to the families, anybody they could talk to. Terry Gillery's name came up. This is the state troopers? The state troopers. Okay. Yes. So, so they the, started the, just going out. They, they just went on their the, own. Okay. They did this on their own. On their own. They were retired. Okay. Got they it. just got frustrated with the whole situation. So they started talking to the families and everybody they talked to, friends, family, whatever. Terry Gillery's name came up. Uh, allegations that he had sex with the girls when, uh, when he was a warden. And they said, at the very least, that was malfeasance, that he was having sex and it could be proven. Now, there was a lawsuit filed in federal court in 2007 from uh, Lisa Allen versus Terry Gillery for se uh, sexually assaulted by a guard. Terry was the warden then, and Sheriff, Sheriff Edwards stated that he didn't know about that at the time and wouldn't comment any further, which was standard for him. No commenting is standard. The case was settled, but not before the accused jailer, Mark Ivory, took his own life. The do and documents pulled show this type of thing went on since 2002. It's like 2002. Well, the thing is, the thing is, in, in, in it's might it might just Louisiana. I don't know, but in Louisiana, it it you can't really expect a guard at a prison or a jail to know that it's against the rules or against the law to sleep with one of the prisoners. When when you take into consideration that they're not even aware that they're not supposed to sleep with their cousin, <laughs> it's insane. So I just, Bucky, yeah, I just I just wanted to point. I thought I should point that out. Yeah. So Bucky Me when when he was you know looking for stuff, there was a deputy that was charged with having sex in the jail. The state of Louisiana versus Eric My uh, Myron Phillips. Terry was not the warden then but conducted the investigative interviews. One of the witnesses was his cousin, Nicole Gilry. She was the eighth victim. Right. It was Danny Sims, the one with the sex trailer, and Terry. And Nicole stated in the documentary that Eric Phillips slept with her in jail. And she was pretty graphic about it. Right. When she was, you know, it, it, she, and she said that you know, it's not like being in jail. It's like being on the streets, only you can't go nowhere. But you're still doing everything you're doing when you're home. So they were giving that, they were bringing them meals and things like that, like they were doing that kind of stuff for them too? Yeah, and drugs and drugs. sex. And then having sex in the jail. So did Terry Gilliam, he, was he a, a jailer? Was he ever a jailer? He was the he was a warden. I don't know if he, he was, was the, ever a okay, jailer. So he was he was the warden. So so we have a guy that is a warden of a jail that is investigate that that people were having sex in the jail while he was the warden. He then in turn gets put in charge of the investigation <laughs> of sex in the jail. That was and they discussed this uh, with Nicole. That was July of '02. That's when the, the ex-state troopers found out about the Eric Myron Phillips case. Oh, okay. That was the, then he was the, in, the investigator. And his cousin, Nicole, is who he was doing the interview with. He, and, Dan, and Danny Sims, who was, had the sex trailer. It's just... Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're on it. They're on it. They're on it. So we've got nobody's not doing anything. You've got, it, it's a national, you know, there was, Campbell Robertson wrote stuff up in the New York Times. The Jennings newspaper reporter, Scott Lewis, he wrote about it all the time. The last murder was under, while the FBI, the eighth murder, the FBI was there. 
Were they? Okay, so they they did The eight murders when the FBI was there. That was under their watch, too, and the state troopers and everybody. Yeah, I don't know. But I guess maybe there are. I don't really know of any police department that is going to wait for eight bodies to pile up before they call the FBI or some kind of some kind of like state. You know, I'm sure every state has their own like OBI, the Ohio Bureau of Investigation. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's. Well, the thing is, is that the sheriff is the one that says when they call. Right. Yeah. No, I I understand that. I'm just saying, like, who else is going to wait that long? And, and or and why? Well, we know why. <laughs> We're start. It's starting to become clear why. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I mean, Nicole had said she knew who was perpetrating the murders from the first one. After Loretta's murder, that's when she became paranoid. She even locked herself in her room for two weeks. She and she told her family that she actually saw someone being murdered, and a and lot that- of those women did. A lot Nicole, of those women, Nicole's the eight, Nicole was the eight, number eight. eight, eight number, yeah. She was number eight. But a, okay. some of the other girls saw the, some of the girls before them be murdered. Well, of course, they got murdered. There was a witness close to Muggy Brown. I believe she was the third, I believe. The only thing I find strange is that it was just the women. Like, no men that wit. There, were there any men well, that wit- witnessed these murders? And if they did, how come they were right. Why exactly? Remember, I, t- I had said in the in our first um, podcast that the fisherman found her. That there was someone that found her first. Loretta Chason uh, Lewis's body. That was Muggy Brown. She saw that body floating before anybody else. But she, they're not. No one's claiming that she witnessed the murder. No, but okay. she saw her body to to anybody, and you know, except. She had a sister and her grandparents. Kristen Lopez, she was interrogated in Loretta's case. After the interview, Kristen, well, they inter- did it in a, in a room and closed the door. And they said, um, her family said that she was extremely shaken up and would never say what took place in that interview room. Fear was just all over her. And again, Muggy, she was interviewed as a witness in the Ernestine Patterson murder when she was uh, on South Andrews Street area. Brittany Gary said loudly that Uncle Frankie killed Whitney. These girls, they saw so much. They knew so much. Well, the the cops are up to their eyeballs in in this, in in these murders, whether they participated in them or they helped cover them up or whatever. And they're bringing witnesses into interrogation rooms. And when the witnesses come out of the interrogation rooms, they're, they're petrified. Right. That's basically what you're yeah. saying. Eventually dead. And then, and then eventually they're murdered themselves. The Crystal Zeno one. She told, she told Brittany Gary that she knew who killed Muggy Brown. All three of those people are dead. Right. Nicole's mother. I mean, it just goes on and on. Well, it it's Nicole said the police clearly it obvious. All it's it obvious just, that I mean we can kind of all read between the lines as to what what's going on here and why the families don't trust the cops and why they feel I guess they probably feel pretty abandoned. It, they do feel abandoned. They feel like nothing is being done because somebody knows and they won't say. Right. Or if they do and, say, they end up dead. Uh, or right. They recant or they're so afraid, you know, they're not going to say a word. Right. Now, there was a there was a police officer in Lake Arthur who, after Terry Gilry left Jennings, was his boss, Raymond Mott. Raymond was a nar- work narcotics. And he said, you know, when you arrest somebody, you try to get them to roll over. You you ask them, OK. You want to work off three charges or you give me the name of a dirty cop. And when people heard dirty cop, they said 80% of the time, Terry Gilry's who they gave him. Then Terry, Terry threatened to to quit that police department unless they fired uh, Raymond. You know, it's crazy. So the guy inquiring about dirty cops, the dirty cop wants him fired. 
Right. And, and did, did they do? Did they fire him? Eventually, yes. Okay. They did. They uh, did get him fired the summer of I think it was 2014. He gets fired for a. He 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 went to a rally in North Carolina that was he thought was for one thing. It was supposed to be a protest for illegal about illegal illegal immigration. It turned into be a KKK rally. They his picture got taken, and he uh, reported the whole thing to the FBI. They turned the whole thing around on him. I gotta the, ask a question and get your take on it because are, are you telling me this guy said he went accidentally went to a KKK rally? It wasn't supposed to be a KKK rally. When he pulled up... He was he with saw... people that, that he knew. Right, but when he saw the people in the hoods... Yeah, then he knew it was a KKK rally. He, he didn't go... He didn't go... Uh, what? That was my same thought, but evidently the people with him put on their stuff when they got there. So I don't I... know if they set him up. Yeah, I don't know if somebody know. set him they, up or I'm what. Not, I'm not sure I'm buying. They took a picture of him, and there was a guy standing beside him with the KK. He didn't have one on, but this guy. But but the bot. But the bottom line of it was, is he gave this information to the FBI, and because of that, the Louisiana KKK lost their charter members. The police department sat on it for a while until they needed it. Now, in Lake Arthur, he was making four to five busts every shift which was substantial. And if it was, a, if it was a good bust, you know, with quite a bit of narcotics or money, he would put the guy's picture in the paper and put a write-up in it and all that. Terry told him, you can't do that. You can't do narcotics like that in a small town. And he said, um, you stop putting that stuff in the paper. People are sick and tired of, of reading about that. People are tired of hearing about your drug bust. And, and Flat told him, stop doing your drug bust. He said, that's it. You're done doing drug busts. Stop doing it. And he put, then he got fired. They pulled the picture up. You know, right before they, they did that, they had gotten called to a, uh, it was Crystal's, Crystal Zeno's, uh, there was a disturbance at her sister's residence. And Raymond and Terry had gone out there, asked her what was going on. Raymond asked her what was going on. And she flipped when she saw Terry. And she just went crazy. And he's going, whoa, 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 what's going on? You know? And she said, he kept pointed to him. And she said, he killed my sister. And, you know, Raymond was telling him, you know, I hear a lot of stuff. And started talking to him, you know. And he said, I hear a lot of stuff about sex and those girls and, you know, all this stuff. And he said, Terry told him, um, you can believe about 95% of what you hear. So he just, he just admits it. Basically, yeah. He said, it, it, Raymond said, you know, I, I think he confessed it to me. And he said, later on, Terry told him, uh, try to do the right things because your demons will come back and they will find you. And Terry t had told him that there were several different killers. I, I think I, I, I believe that. I, I could believe and that then, Frankie killed a couple and maybe he killed a couple. Uh, maybe um, one, the one, the second victim may have been killed by those two men, those two guys, yeah, uh, for whatever reason. And then, you know, so yeah, I, I believe, mm -hmm. there, I definitely believe that there could be multiple people involved with these, that they're not all the P, the victims are all similar, but the motives and the, and that kind of thing may have been different. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about even the motives. This, besides, well, because uh, the reason besides I say is, Whitney Dubois, uh, you know, the motives. I don't know. Well, you got one getting somebody get, higher up. You got one getting a throat throat slit and stabbed. Okay, then you got another one that gets beat up first, or a couple of them that get beat up, like beat up like you would beat up somebody that crossed you, like you beat them up and then you kill them. Because they crossed, because they crossed you, did did something you didn't. Well, you're uh, making a you're making an example out of them. Right, you're making an example out of them. So you, that you have that kind of style, then you have one that just get gets strangled, right? They or they th or they they're pretty well, sure they, pretty sure she was just strangled. Yeah. Well, they a lot of you so know you got di you got these different you got these different methods that are, are being 
employed. So it, it tends to, to me, it tends to, to make me think that there's, it's different people and for, and for different reasons. Oh, I think they made it look different on purpose. Well, they could have done that. That's true. Uh, but most, most serial killers don't do that. So yeah, it definitely think, not a serial killer. Definitely don't think it would be a serial killer that did this. Um, but yeah, you're right. They could have like the one that had the bleach poured on them. Uh, that that's something like a cop might know to do. Right. It it's destroys evidence and that kind of thing. So who knows? So that's going to be it for part two of this series. There will be a part three. Um, it probably won't be as long as the first two parts. Not 100% sure on that, but it'll probably be a little bit shorter. We got just a few more things to go over, but we this podcast was running a little long, and so we wanted to uh, get it out there. I know people are waiting to hear the second part, so I want to thank everyone for listening. Uh, we really appreciate all the support. Some of our some of our podcasts uh, are doing really really good, and we really appreciate that. One more time, thanks again for listening, and uh, peace, love, and stay groovy, guys. Bye.